some uh, enhancement in terms of your eyes. So if I take my glasses off, I can't see a lot of you. I certainly can't read. So I'm down here somewhere on this bell curve chart. In terms of my vision, my doctor, my ophthalmologist has worked with me to bring me to what she calls a normal range. That's much better. So when we talk about medical treatments, we're talking about something that's going to bring you back within a normal range of functioning. Now there are, there are going to be outliers here, right? You're going to have people who have incredible vision, who are one or two or three standard deviations above the mean. Maybe 28 vision. I think that's the best recorded vision in human history. 20 over 8. It's incredible vision, right? My vision isn't nearly that good. So what we're talking about here with medical treatments is bringing people back into some normal range of functioning. All right. How many of you here have had a therapeutic treatment that brings you back into a normal range of functioning? Good. All right. We've all had that, right? Anybody want to care to share one? <laughs> I just shared one. Maybe two. Let's hear from two people. What have you had done that brings you back into a normal range of function? My, yeah, Mark. My grandson has diabetes. Okay. He's so on, on all the time medical. Good. Okay, diabetes. Bringing your grandson back into a normal range of function. Excellent. Who else? Yeah. Low thyroid. Low thyroid. Low thyroid. So you take medication for that, and that brings you back into a normal range of functioning. We could list all kinds of things that wouldn't surprise us, nor would they, honestly, they wouldn't be that interesting to us. We've gotten used to these, right? We've gotten used to these kinds of therapeutic enhancements that are absolutely stunning when we think about it. Well, let's take a look at some of the more stunning medical enhancements that we have in the world today, right? Let's start with um, genetics. This young woman right here, um, a young woman from London was born with leukemia. So doctors decided to bring her back into a normal range of functioning. They would go only into her body. Soma, that's the Greek word for body. They would go into her body alone, take her cells out, and then replace them with a therapeutic enhancement. This young woman now will grow up essentially free of leukemia. That's amazing. So that's, that's therapeutic enhancement. We're bringing that, that young toddler, we're bringing her into a therapeutic range of functioning. What else? Um, there are some newer ones that are pretty stunning. Artificial redness. We can now take people who are functionally blind, implant a computer chip into their eye, which directly connects it to their brain, and they can see again. So the purpose of this is to bring them back into a normal range of functioning. Again, we're not into the good stuff yet. This is the ordinary now that we're talking about in terms of bringing people into a normal range of functioning. This young woman now has an exoskeleton. She is a paraplegic. She can't walk, but she can now. She has a robotic exoskeleton that allowed her to go to her graduation last year and to walk across that stage and to get her diploma. We're bringing her back into a normal range of function. Synthetic blood transplants. University College of London now does this routinely, right? They run out of blood or a person can't take a certain kind of blood. Blood substitutes. Bringing that person back into a normal range of functioning. Spray on skin. This young man right here, again in England, had a kettle, a tea kettle, scalding teacup all over him. Burned his chest. The doctor from Australia flew in, took his skin cells, and they sprayed them back onto him. So now he is moving towards full recovery, recovery there. So again, we're just talking about therapy, right? Brain computer interfaces. Michael Choros at the top here, a famous author, was functionally deaf. 
He now has two cochlear implants that are connected to his brain. He can now hear you speak. The man below him had his arm severed in a train accident. The nerves were still there. The nerve endings from his shoulder were still there. They hooked a prosthetic limb up to him. His brain is now telling his prosthetic limb to move. So he can now move his fingers just as you can. He's bringing her out back into a normal range of functioning. Let me pause there. Does everybody get what I'm talking about here? Yeah. Questions? You want to get to the good stuff, don't you? Yeah. I, I like this cartoon. My brother, my brother in law, Rodney, just got married. Do you, Cynthia, who's completely free of genetic engineering, take Rodney, who is equally free of genetic engineering? <laughs> so now we get into some cases that are more interesting and some great lines. James Young, again in London. University College London. Uh, again, his arm was severed in a train accident. I'm not sure what it is about England trains and prosthetic limbs, but here you go. His arm was severed in a train accident, and he said, I don't want just a normal functioning limb. I want the prosthetic limb that is hooked into my brain, right? I want to be able to think, move my pinky, and my prosthetic pinky moves, but I also want a flashlight in my finger. And I want a heart rate monitor. And I want a screen so I can read my Facebook. And I want a USB port so I can charge my phone. And I want a little storage compartment, not a man purse. A storage compartment where I can stick my phone in there and it will charge. I can close it, lock it, and it's with me all the time. And oh yes, oh yes, I also want a drone hooked up to my heart. So now we're in a situation where he went to a show that was going to be on the BBC and it was going to track disabled persons out in the wilderness with Bear Grylls. Remember Bear Grylls, the survivor man guy? And Bear Grylls said, you're not disabled. In fact, you're something else, right? Most people we know don't have drones on their arm. So now we're moving something past therapeutic into something of an enhanced version of humanity. David Williams at the University of Rochester has said what we're going to be able to do and what we can do right now is take your vision and enhance it to 25 vision. Placing your visual acuity halfway between that of human beings and eagles. An eagle can see for two miles. So now we're into something else. And David Williams and his team at the University of Rochester have started to move people well beyond what we would consider a normal range of human functioning. Way off to this side of that bell curve. And when we get into that kind of medical treatment, now we're starting to talk about the interesting stuff, which is radical human enhancement. That's where we're taking someone and we're moving them, someone who's healthy, and we're moving them well beyond what we would see walking around for cause. We're moving them two, three, four, five standard deviations beyond what we would see a normal person capable of, or something we've never seen before. We're augmenting healthy human beings. Now, human enhancement is a shifting concept. How many of you have grandparents who were born in the 1800s? Lots of you. If you brought your grandparents here today, what might they say about you in terms of how you've been augmented, in terms of how you have been enhanced? Say it again. Taller, bigger. Taller? <laughs> yeah. How so? What things do we have that our grandparents would be absolutely stunned by? Yeah, Linda. Knees and hips. 
Artificial knees, artificial hips, absolutely. Maybe your grandparents would consider that to be statistically, that's an aberration, that's bizarre. That's human augmentation. Where else? Hearing aids. Hearing aids, absolutely. Good. What else? Cataract. Cataract surgeries. Heart surgeries. Can you imagine if you would have told my grandfather who rode a horse to school? He rode a horse to school. That I could fit something this powerful into my breast pocket? In a real sense, I've been augmented, and that concept has now shifted. This doesn't interest very many people anymore. This is not that interesting to most people. So the, the, what I'm trying to get at here is the concept of human augmentation and radical human enhancement is a shifting concept in and of itself. Wander on to any major Research One institution in the United States and read the research they're doing. Genetics, robotics, information technologies, nanotechnologies, neurosciences, military sciences, pharma, pharmacological sciences. All of these that are now starting to converge are, for the first time in human history, allowing us to leapfrog over certain parts of what we never thought possible before. So let's take a look at a few, a few of these technologies um, so that you can get a sense of what I'm talking about here. Let's start simple. Pharmacological enhancements, right? Um, I have many students, many students that I teach who say, Dr. McPhee, wander onto any college campus and within a couple hours you could find Adderall, Modafinil, as they call it, Modafinil, uh, beta blockers, and this is for healthy functioning students, students who are well within the range of normal human functioning. Taking Adderall, a stimulant, to sit down for the law school test, the LSAT, or the MCAT, so they can lock in for several hours at a time. Or to find, as my students used to do, drive up into Canada, buy Modafinil, which is a wakefulness agent, allows you to skip a night's sleep. What college student doesn't like that, right? Skip a night's sleep, and then be normally functioning the next day. Beta blockers. Uh, what do beta blockers do? Calm you down, right? 80% of musicians and major orchestras now are on beta blockers. They're enhanced in some way, right? They don't feel the same kind of anxiety that they would normally feel because of these high-pressure situations. We're just getting cranked up here. Just getting cranked up. Human enhancements, brain-computer interfaces. This is Hans Jonas, a German who decided to have a digital eye implanted so that he could see a range of colors and objects that no other human has ever seen before. So he walks around now with that funky looking pair of glasses right there. And he can see things that you and I cannot see. He's enhanced in some way. He's moved well beyond what is statistically normal into a realm that we're now kind of saying, okay, what's, what's going on here? We're not sure really how to process this or think about this. Um, some research, researchers now are moving into parabolic hearing. Anybody here into hearing? Know what parabolic hearing is? What's, what's parabolic hearing? Allowing, and if you were all talking in here, I could look at a couple on the back and tune everything else out and look at those two and hear what they're talking about. So parabolic hearing, moving into the realm of statistically what we see today abnormal. Nanotechnology, operating at the billionth of a meter. Moving into an environment where we inject human beings with drug delivery mechanisms so that we can fight particular cancers or particular diseases or enhance people. Deliver drugs to them that will actually enhance them, move them 
well beyond what is statistically possible. Robots and artificial intelligence. Um, the one at the top is the one I want first, a robotic snowblower, please. <laughs> but also mows your lawn and trims your hedges. Rebecca, Christmas lift. <laughs> It's about $3,000, it's fully robotic, it is fully AI, you can just program it and walk away. It opens the garage door, lets itself out, and blows off the snow. You may not consider that a human enhancement, I do. I don't want to mow the yard, so that's a human enhancement for me. Other forms of robotics and artificial intelligence, um, a lot of you have it in your phone, right? Siri? Samsung, right? I can talk to my phone, I set dates with my phone to update certain kinds of information. In a very real way, that has enhanced me. I don't ever remember anyone's phone number anymore at all. I don't want your, to know your phone number. I don't even want to know my son's phone number, right? Why? Because it's in here. It's part of me in some real way. If I lose this, well, it's backed up, but if, I, if it wasn't backed up, I'd be in real trouble. Right? So in some way, that has enhanced me at some level. We now have robotic preschool assistants, and we can make them cute and furry, like Leonardo, who can interact with children, and when they mispronounce or get a word wrong, the AI program knows exactly where to take them and to move them along in their reading program. And yes, didn't put a picture up here of it, but we do now have uh, the world's first intimate companion robots, Roxy and Rick. <laughs> Not suitable for work, so I won't put a picture of them up here, but yes, we do have intimate companion robots now. Some of you have been looking at the latest uh, in terms of genetics. The big splash in the last year or so has been CRISPR genetics. CRISPR genetics, where you can go in and, and add, delete, modify. Here's what goes on with that. It's called germline engineering. You go into an embryo, really a blastocyst. You go into the foundations of human life. You add, you delete, you modify. And when that embryo grows up into a, few, a full human being and it reproduces, it passes everything on to the next generation. So you are permanently changing the human genetic code in that person. And many of you know that in April of 2015, Chinese scientists for the first time did this on a non-viable human embryo. Great Britain just got permission for it. And last week, a scientist in Sweden said, I will do it in a viable human embryo. And if I can't do it in Sweden, I'll go to the Bahamas. So this is what we're up against in terms of thinking about human enhancement. And religious figures, congregations, persons, religious persons are struggling to keep up with this. Even as scientists are struggling to keep up with this. This is overwhelming. And most of us don't know what to do with all of this. So I'm going to move now to just looking at a few religious voices to think about where our voices are in all of this. I like this cartoon a lot, you know, two scientists passing by the genetics laboratory. What kind of God are you playing today? The New Testament God or the Old Testament God? <laughs> so Linda, um, I'm going to have you read a few of these religious voices here that uh, uh, we have on tap for us. Let's start off with uh, Hava Tarosh Sam Hassan, a Jewish theologian at Arizona State University. Radical human enhancement is misguided because of its mechanistic, engineering-driven approach to being human, its obsession with perfection understood in terms of performance and accomplishments rather than moral integrity, and its disrespect for the unknown future. From the vantage point of the Jewish tradition, at least, the idea of indefinite postponement of death is the highest form of human hubris. One more example of human rebellion against God who created humans as finite beings whose life narrative has a beginning, 
a middle, and an end. I can listen to her theory all day. <laughs> 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 um, so what voice, right? Um, very much against human enhancement, very much against the forms of human enhancement that we've been talking about, especially germline engineering. That's the big one right now that's getting all the attention, germline engineering. But if you talk to Hoppe, you cannot possibly cover all of these technologies. So she's focusing in on one area. Um, let's move to another Jewish voice, um, Lori Zoboff, who hopefully will be here, sponsored by TIR next year. Lori is someone who is very active in the pushback against the privatization of germline engineering. At Harvard today, an invitation-only group of mostly scientists, lawyers, and entrepreneurs, 150 in total, met to discuss if and how to synthesize from scratch an entire human genome, the heritable genetic material that in nature is transferred from parents to children. To create a human genome from scratch would be an enormous moral gesture whose consequences should not be framed initially on the advice of lawyers and regulators alone. Critical voices representing civil society who have long been skeptical of synthetic biology's claims should be included. The creation of new human life is one of the last human-associated processes that has not yet been industrialized or fully commodified. It remains an act of faith, joy, and hope. Okay, again, strong pushback there against George Church of Harvard and a private members-only meeting uh, to create a human genome from scratch. Let's take a look, though, at a Buddhist voice, someone who um, clearly wants to push us forward in terms of human enhancement. And this is James Hughes, who uh, is a sociologist now at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, and he runs a large organization on human enhancement. You can find him on the internet at He's written a lot on this. He's a Buddhist. Future technologies will include drugs, implanted devices, and gene therapies that target specific moods, cognitions, impulses, and behaviors. From a Buddhist perspective, the growing ability to control our behavior will be an opportunity to suppress unskillful impulses and behaviors and enhance our practice of virtues. Mental illness and more routine emotional liability can be smoothed out and mood ramped up to an optimal level of high dynamic well-being. The Buddhist rejection of the idea of an essential core self and emphasis on self-transformation will likely become more attractive as personalities become more malleable. Okay, how about one last voice and then uh, we'll do a case study and you can talk a little bit, okay? How about that be? Um, let's go to the Mormon Transhumanist Association, a growing group who has a large spring meeting that brings transhumanists in from all over the world, mostly religious, um, and they become something of an item in the Mormon church. The Mormon church is not really sure how to deal with this group. We seek the spiritual and physical exaltation of individuals and their anatomies, as well as communities and their environments, according to their wills, desires, and laws, to the extent they are not oppressive. We believe that scientific knowledge and technological power are among the means ordained of God to enable such exaltation, including real life realization of diverse prophetic visions of transfiguration, immortality, resurrection, renewal of this world, 
and the discovery and creation of worlds without end. We feel a duty to use science and technology according to wisdom and inspiration, to identify and prepare for risks and responsibilities associated with future advances, and to persuade others to do likewise. Okay, these are a few of the voices uh, that I'm hearing in terms of responses to radical human enhancement. I have a lot of other voices I could draw on here. I'm just giving you a selection. Um, how about we go to a case study and you can talk? How's that sound? Let's do that. And what I'd like to hear from you here is uh, a couple things. I'd like to hear from you, number one, after I read the case study, and you're going to talk to each other at your table, so introduce yourselves. Okay, be nice. What's your gut reaction to these technologies? What's your gut tell you when you hear about these following human enhancement scenarios? And secondly, how does your religion or your spirituality or your worldview play a role in how you would sort this out, how you would ultimately process what's going on here? All right, you got that? Gut reaction, and then more of a process reaction using your worldview, spirituality, or your religious background. All right, do you want an easy one or a hard one? I heard it easy. All right, here's the easy one. Sarah McDonald is a mother who takes pride in her family clan. She is also deeply impressed by bioluminescence, the chemical properties that allow organisms to glow in the dark. She plans on finding a fertility unit overseas that will implant the genetic properties of bioluminescence into her offspring through germline engineering. These glow in the properties will create a special bond between her and the rest of her family. She wants her great great grandchildren to never forget that they are part of the McDonald clan. Talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> Anything else you want to throw on it, but it doesn't give 
I guess this issue of like, do I have a choice right. about how I want to live my life is taken from that person in some way, or all these people in some way, because of one person's decision. That's what religious emphasis call the open future question. Will Sarah's great great grandchildren have an open future? That is, an unaltered future where they themselves can decide whether they wanted bioluminescence inside of them. And that's one of the great things that we're struggling with in ethics now, especially in religious ethics, is that idea of the open future. All right, let's move on to another one, shall we? Regina. Here she is on the right with her daughter, Lucinda. Regina is a mother of four young children, all under the age of eight. Hmm. You remember those days? <laughs> she is from a very wealthy family. Her children are active, healthy, and robust. She has a small yard near the edge of a very busy street. Many of the neighbor kids come to play at her house. She can't keep up with all the activity. Recently, her youngest daughter, Lucinda, started playing with us in the street when Regina decided enough is enough. She was preoccupied with the other kids. So, Regina contacted Boston Dynamics, which is a real company, about their new swarming robot special packages. Regina has decided that these robots, which swarm, will be her backup, preventing her children from entering the streets without her permission or that of the robots. Bonus, these robots come with special warming and cooling units for very hot and cold for college winter days and summer days. These swarm robots scan the child every 15 minutes, monitoring their critical, critical bodily functions, alerting Regina to when those kids need care. Your gut reaction to this, number one, and number two, how do you bring your religious tradition, your worldview, your spirituality into this? Talk amongst yourselves. Yeah. I saw it as a gadget, like a baby mom. Uh, okay. I saw it as a mechanism for little boys getting a Christian Little boys are using these things, right? Does anybody know why we're developing these at Boston Dynamics, which Develop Big Dog, the autonomous robot, which is a pack animal for the field. Cost savings. Cost savings. Why does the military really want swarm robots? For like the yeah. Exactly. Security measures, right? And also to abide by Geneva Convention rules on the battlefield. If we can herd the enemy with swarming robots, if we can herd around ISIS and bring them into a spot, then we can essentially disarm them. So the military is developing this, but of course it's always going to have dual use, right? Civilians are going to want to use this too. Anybody, anybody would, would like to see this in their yard? Anybody want some swarming robots for their grandkids? A uh, baseball bat. A baseball bat. A baseball bat.
during the day, on different children during the day because they were being watched by these other eyes. Okay. Let's go to one last one, and then I've got a handout for you that you can work on in your small groups. Uh, this one's sensitive, and I know it's sensitive, so we'll treat it appropriately. A childhood of severe sexual abuse has left Martin emotionally and at times physically incapable of sexual intimacy. Martin recently heard about a robotic device, Roxy, geared towards human intimacy. He is leaning towards Roxy because he feels it will be his first step towards healing and reclaiming his sexuality. And that's about the cleanest picture I can find of Roxy out there. <laughs> Gut reaction, and then religious ideas, views, worldviews. Talk to each other here. To engage uh, in sexual acts so that they could be engaged in therapy, essentially. As you saw this, uh, what was your gut reaction? Let's hear from some people who have not, not talked yet. Yeah, David. Uh, I'm not sure that that's going to help resolve the problem because it's a human relationship problem. And that's not a human relationship that he's... I don't know. I, I'd be interested to see what... Have, have they studied this? Has it helped? You know? Uh, I know it's not been studied. Roxy's only been out two years, so... Okay. No clinical trials yet. Yeah. Because <laughs> I think part of the... I think you can also... You know, if you can get sexually fixated on a machine, but I'm not sure that helps transfer to the human relationship. So... So that would be a big question, I think. For yeah, me. interesting. Other examples.
Pew Research Foundation uh, surveys. And uh, what I ask you to do is just to look at the charts and what, what pops out at you here, what's new, new, interesting, or noteworthy. And if you look at the first one there, um, the U.S. general public opinion on human enhancement. Now, you answer these questions on the other side, right? You weighed in on gene editing, brain chip implants, and synthetic blood. Here's what the general U.S. population said. Gene editing that is permanent, 50% would not want, but look at that, 48% would want. Brain chip implant for much improved cognitive abilities, 66 for, 32 against. And if you start breaking it down, younger generations, it's, oh, did I miss, mix it up? 66 against. 32-4, sorry about that. If you move down to the younger generations, it is not flipped. Younger generations overwhelmingly say, brain chips, so I can remember, calc 3, heck yeah. So I can learn German and never forget it, or at least have a backup scaffolding in my brain, so I wouldn't forget this stuff? Yeah, I want that. And then finally, synthetic blood, 63% would not want, and 35 would. What jumps out at you there is you take a look at the general U.S. population. Anything surprising? Yes, yeah, sir. It just seems like if it's preventing something negative, that's, people are more warmed up to that idea at least in these three. And the other two, if it's an enhancement to go beyond like what we've been talking about, people are getting, it's a very different experience. Yeah, that's a very interesting. If it's therapeutic, people are like, oh, yeah, you yeah. know, therapy, sure. But enhancement, uh, cross the line. Something's going on here. We're not so sure about that. Others, yeah. Well, the cognitive abilities, um, if you're talking about uh, children who have severe cognitive impairment, mm -hmm. that's a whole different issue. Yeah, absolutely. So the, we're talking here about cognitively, uh, statistically within the range of what we would consider normal IQs. Yeah. Okay, uh, how about the second poll there? U.S. public opinion on the following statement. Radical life extension. We're talking here to 125 or 150 years old. Would it be a good thing for society? And the Pew Research Center went in and polled all adults, but then specifically went in and broke it down by Christian background. So we'll focus on Christianity here. What strikes you there? So, uh, Dan, can you tell us how to read this, though? Is it 41% of U.S.? Would be for that. Would be. Would be for that. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. So if you read that chart, 41% of U.S. adults would be for radical life extension. Hey, skip down to there. White mainline Protestants. I'm Methodist. 41% say, yeah, we want that. So right in line there with general public opinion. Yeah.
it might be 51, 52% would say 125, if I'm healthy, that's a good thing. 150, maybe. Okay, that's a great question. So if you flip back on the question three, that's why I asked this particular question. So should certain human enhancements be subsidized by the US federal government or any government? If you want to hear what most religious communities and most religious ethicists have been talking about, it's the question of distributive justice. Who gets what and for what reason? So, if we are really talking about a tide, right, a general tide that's rising in terms of therapeutic devices that are maybe turning into enhancement devices, what kind of mechanisms do we have in place here to ensure that the benefits and the burdens would be shared equally across all income groups in the United States, India, wherever we're talking? So that's where religious voices are focusing in on right now. The Vatican statements on these matters focus almost exclusively on the question of distributive justice and the question of personhood, those two questions. Are we changing the human person? But they speak much more on distributive justice. How do we secure these things? The Methodist Church, my tradition, very concerned about distributive justice. National Council of Churches in 2006 came out. Wonderful document. Oh, fearfully and wonderfully made. Their main concern, they would not comment on whether specific technologies were legitimate or illegitimate. What they said was, they asked the question that you were asking, distributive justice. So, the likelihood that, that there will be germline editing for 8 billion people with equal access is nowhere on the horizon near or far. In that sense, it's always going to be in any foreseeable future an immediate schedule. Dr. Ralston, well said there. Um, we're not close even to getting vaccines to the entire world, right? So, why are we talking about this? Well, we're talking about it because it's happening. But I think your point here is well taken. Distributive justice, not for the United States only, but for 8 billion, 9 billion people, that's a tough sell. That's a very tough sell when we're talking about germline engineering or cognitive enhancements. And I think most of us know where these enhancements will happen first. Where are they going to happen first? Where are they happening right now? The wealthiest of the wealthy, right? Medical tourism. The wealthiest of the wealthy going to India to have germline engineering done for their family. Not the people of India, but for the wealthiest of the wealthy. All right. Um, let's just pause here and let's open it up. And uh, TIR asked me to do this. Let's open it up for questions or comments to kind of wrap things up here. We've got, what, about 10 minutes, Linda? Um, actually, we go beyond that as well. People are interested in asking questions. Okay, great. I've got other case studies, too. I've got plenty of material. So, um, if you want another case study, we can do that. But let's just open the floor up for you to ask questions and to respond. Um, so, General, open it up. Uh, let's go back to Ruth and then Dr. Wilson. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Wilson, you mentioned that there's been a lot of talk about Yeah, when you're asking a question, these opinion poll questions, do people understand the ramifications of these things? Ruth, what do you think? I don't think they do. Of course not. I don't even understand how my cell phone works. I think you want to come again next year. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks for coming, sir. I appreciate it. So, I, I, if, 
I think the general public, when asked about germline engineering, I don't think most of them understand it. And to be honest, I didn't understand it until I started digging in and reading about this. I didn't understand synthetic blood. This is part of what I do. This is part of what I research. I, I look into the scientific communities and I say, are you kidding? What? You did what? So I don't think the general public has a clue in terms of what's going on, nor should they necessarily, right? There's another technology that... Jump in. ...that claims to be the theologians like Seidel here at CSU uh, takes a blastocyst from a cow and cuts it eight ways and then implants each segment in eight different recipient cows and you get eight identical twins. Right. Now, in theory, that's possible with human beings, too. We can take a blastocyst. And interesting, that's one soul and one body, according to the uh, of theology. Uh, and now we cut it in half. Where did the second soul come from? If the other one has a soul. Right. And that's kind of an embarrassment to those who believe that the soul is implanted at exactly the point where the sperm fertilizes the egg. And to me, this is kind of a really interesting theological question. That's a very interesting theological question, one that the religious communities have dodged quite nicely, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> right? So, uh, cloning of animals. We've been doing this for a long time, right? In theory, it's really possible. In theory, it is absolutely possible with human beings. Of course, all kinds of risks associated with it. But that's one thing that actually many countries in the world have effectively put a moratorium on, is cloning for human beings. So the theological question for now has been dodged. But th that's a very interesting point there. Yeah. Thanks for bringing that up. I have a question on that. Oh. Yeah. Sir, yeah. I was talking about the Social Security. Yeah. I remember when George W. Bush came in and said we ought to do something about Social Security. It wasn't properly funded. They started telling us all oh, that money was all in a lockbox. <laughs> what lockbox? <laughs> okay, so that's a, they're paying it out of the money that people pay into it now. Yeah. Now that's a very interesting question with regard to radical life extension, right? Yeah, and that's right. I, that's what I was getting at is we don't have the money. We're keeping the fund broke. And, you know, I'm almost 90 years old. Are you going to be for 70 years? Can, can Social Security withstand the weight yeah. of an extra 70 years of life after you retire? I'm not going to be able to retire until 75 or 80, as it is. I was going to say, the retirement age would have to be significantly increased. I mean, that's a huge economic burden to have you put that on. Very interesting points. The economic parts of this are amongst the most interesting because those are things we really haven't thought about much. And the distributive justice questions around these are, it's absolutely fascinating. We're just now starting, oh, oh, Social Security, radical life extension? Holy cow. Robotics? Are we going to keep our jobs? Yeah, John.
Defense Advanced Research Project Agency, they say, what's the world going to look like in 100 years? What should it look like? We'll come up with it. We'll fund it. You think about it as a researcher. Here's some money. Go think big thoughts, right? Yeah, that's interesting. 
there's a, there's a lot of narcissism in here, and I don't, you know, I wouldn't question that at all. There is a lot of narcissism in here. There's also a lot of many well-intentioned people here who want to literally leapfrog over generations of technology to go into the poorest parts of the world and to leapfrog over generations of technology that slowly got us where we are today. Go into places in Africa and do germline engineering for malaria to fight malaria. So that people don't have to go through generations of fighting it, but instead move right to the end solution. And so I think if you talk to a lot of researchers, they say, we're not narcissistic here. Yeah, there's money involved in the yeah, we like our careers and all that, but we really want to do good in the world. We want to help people, right? We do think these technologies are fundamentally part of who we're becoming as a human species. So yeah, we're all egotistical, sure, right? We all like what we like, and we're going to pour those resources into ourselves, but, you know, it's a break. What do you think? There's a sense in which, too, and I think those are really interesting. I can tell you're really wrestling with this, and I appreciate that. There's a sense in which the conversations that researchers have and ethicists have are incommensurable. They don't, they don't cross. We don't talk to each other very much. Scientists who do research in improving human vision to the level of an eagle, they really don't care what we're saying. They really don't. If you talk to them, they're saying, why wouldn't you? want to improve human vision that much. And when you tell them, you know, it's humorous, narcissistic, all these things, they look at you, kind of scratch your, their heads and say, oh, interesting, and then they walk away and still do it. So there's, there's a real disconnect there in terms of religious language, ethical language, and what people are doing in the field, in research communities, or at least that's what I'm saying. I feel like the train has already left the station. The train's left the station. And it, the piece that I'm reacting to the most is the robotics and artificial intelligence because I heard a snippet on radio not long ago. A gentleman from Silicon Valley said, we are making robots. And those robots are definitely going to replace people's jobs. Mm -hmm. And so if this is happening, how do we already, in a crisis, where people are not having adequate opportunity for good paying jobs, how do we stop this? How do we make a consideration that says, no, we don't want to go to Chili's and punch in the menu. We want a human contact. So that, to me, is a very troubling part. Yeah, very interesting points here that, you know, Silicon Valley AI researchers are saying, we're pressing ahead. Uh, Uber, you saw what they did in Pittsburgh, right, with these Volvo driverless cabs. All the cab drivers were, what? <laughs> did what? <laughs> here we come for cobbles. Um, very serious issue. And some countries are now considering permanent living wage, a stipend that every person in the country would get regardless of how much they make, simply to buffer them against these kinds of technological advancements. That is a very, very serious issue. The economic side of that, in terms of the loss of jobs, is stunning. And we're already seeing that in so many sectors in our economy. Um, again, religious ethicists are talking about that the most when it comes to these issues. That's what I see the most of these. Do I, have a, do I have a view on that? Yeah. And do you have information on how much that's happening, how serious it is? Uh, 
So mixing animal parts and human parts, right? A, a chimera, right? Taking a bit of animal and injecting it into human dates. That was approved in the UK last year. That was approved. We haven't done it yet, so far as I know. But that was approved. Why? Because animals have certain traits that we want to improve us, to bring us into that therapeutic realm of normal. So the UK has approved that. Nothing fancy yet, like tails or echo vision or anything like that, but just to take a bit of DNA from another animal, insert it into a human being to bring them up to that statistical norm. Or heart valves. Heart valves, exactly. Doping program in place, right? I mean, no doping 
regulation in place. What was stunning about that race? When I, when I see women run, I always think it's stunning. So <laughs> <laughs> what was stunning about Rolanda? How much did she break the world record by? It's huge. 14 seconds. The New York Times the next day, did she break the record by too much? <laughs> Right? So sports is absolutely leading the way on this. Again, if you go back to cycling, uh, two amateur cyclists here in Colorado. Amateur cyclists. One 61-year-old man down in Colorado, uh, Colorado Springs last weekend, was caught doping in a master's race, an amateur master's race. So they, picked, they basically said you can't compete for a year. So yeah, sports is absolutely pressing forward um, all of these kinds of HGH, human growth hormones in the NFL, they're just now starting to test for it. And guess what? In a year and a half, guess how many people the NFL have caught using human growth hormones? Zero. Not one person. Even though players self-report that anonymously they're using human growth hormones. So the test aren't very good Would you want to catch people? If you're the if, if you own a team, do you really want to catch your players? Probably not. You don't want your best player sitting on the sideline. So, thanks, but no thanks. The NBA has almost no regulation on certain types of doping. Again, they don't want to catch people. They want their product to be the best that they can. Yeah. I think the challenge is to distinguish between normal and conventional. The okay. distinction that you're making is that there is a normal, and in fact, what we really mean is conventional. There is no normal. Normal is a statistical figure that we arrive at by measuring things that we think are valuable. Yeah. So we say that a child is normal, but in fact, the child is exceptional, but we don't measure those areas. Yeah, I appreciate you saying that a lot. Um, I mean, I, I think you're exactly right there. I have a sister who's pretty severely cognitively disabled. I consider her normal, right? She has an eye, I won't say I'm cute, I don't think that's appropriate, but it's, it's very normal. But she's very normal to me. Um, I have friends who are geniuses. They're normal to me. This, you're right, this is just a construction, a model that we have constructed that our physicians use, right? Our physicians and doctors and surgeons use to help us. But I think your points are very well taken, and I appreciate that.